How's it going, Bolingbrook Church family? Thank you again for joining us another week here at Bolingbrook Church. We're so happy that you all are here, whether you have been watching us for a long time already, if you're a member at this church, or if this is your first time, thank you for being here. Go ahead and type in the chat where you're from, what your name is, and disconnect with us on the chat because we're excited to be able to engage with you and we have moderators ready and waiting to be able to talk to you guys and share uh, and be a blessing uh, here in our live stream. If this is your first or second time, go ahead and go to our website after the service, bowlingbrook.church forward slash connect and fill out one of our connection cards. And what that does is helps us get to know you better if you're new here. And we wanna be able to help you on your journey with your relationship with Christ. Whether that means you're starting it, or that means you just need help with it. We wanna be here to be a resource and a support to you. If you have children from the ages of zero to 11, we have special programming for them. You can subscribe to our Bolingbrook Church YouTube channel, and in the playlist there, you'll see Disciple Town Kids, or you can head over to Facebook and search Disciple Town Kids and follow that page as well. It has up-to-date uh, weekly messages, video messages for all of our children. Uh, from ages zero to four, they have one lesson, and five to 11, they have another. And they're specialized to be able to talk about God and Jesus on their level, uh, to be able to give them crafts and songs, and also an awesome message to help their relationship with Christ flourish. Now, we are so happy that you all are here, and I believe, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, that I can say that you are here on purpose. That God did not do this by accident. This is not just some coincidence that you're watching with us today. God has a special message for you today. And I just want to ask that you open your heart and your mind today. Uh, and your eyes that you can see the message that God is speaking to you. That your heart can be open. That you can feel the message. And your mind that you're able to think about this message. Because God has a message. He has a plan for you. Today as we start worship. As we... Uh, ready our spirits. I'm praying a special blessing for all of you today that you are all receptive to whatever God is doing in your life. Welcome to Bolingbrook Church and welcome to worship.
Good morning, Bolingbroke family. Pray with me today. God, right now in this moment, uh, I invite you here. I pray for every single person who's hearing my voice. I pray that we can all make room for you, that we can create space, Father God, that we can set aside our worries, our concerns, our thoughts, our anxieties, our fears, and allow you to move in. Father, as we continue to be challenged uh, to live a life that's more, um, Father, I pray that you give us the energy, the strength, and the capacity we need to carry that out. Lord, I pray for every single person that is needing provision. Lord, we know and believe that if we trust in you, that provision will be taken care of, that we will lack nothing. Lord, I pray for those who have been given uh, a path and a, a direction from you, but are experiencing fear or apprehension to follow it. Father, I pray that your will will be done through the lives of this community. I pray that this community uh, seek you for so much more, that it not just be about what we can get, Father God, but it be about what you can do through us, Lord. Father, I pray for any person who is needing healing, not just physical healing, but emotional, spiritual, mental healing. Lord, I pray that they can believe that you have what they need, that you will fill the gaps, Father God, that you will sustain, Lord, that you will continue to lead them and allow the pieces to fall into place for their healing. Father, I pray that you uh, allow us to continue to seek your face and to recognize that the purpose is found, Father God, in you. Our calling is found in you. Our sustenance is found in you. Our peace and joy and love is found in you. The plans that we can't see are found in you, Father God. The job that we're missing is found in you, Father God. The decision that we need to make and we can't make and the wisdom to make it is found in you. Father God, the things that we need on this earth are found in you, Lord. And I pray that as we continue to move towards a deeper walk with you, that you allow us to shine, that you allow us to be transformed in your presence. And so, Father, as we hear the words that you have ordained this morning, I pray that they transform our hearts, our minds, and that they be a catalyst for change for the better. Father, we thank you for loving us, and I pray that you cover all of the requests that are in our hearts that we have spoken and that we have not spoken. Father, thank you for being a God who cares, a God who will carry all of our anxieties and our fears, a God who will carry our burdens, who will give us the strength to, to be able to move and walk in faith. So today, Father God, I pray that we can surrender ourselves to you and completely depend on you as we move in faith towards so much more we love you in your name i pray amen hey everyone we're glad that you're here worshiping with us and today we are coming to the end of our series so much more where over the last three weeks we've been asking the question what is it that god truly desires from us as people of faith and what we've realized is that God is calling us to so much more than even what our minds can conceive, that, that our faith is about so much more than coming to church once a week, that our faith is more than just memorizing a Bible verse, but that our faith is this living, breathing relationship that we have with Jesus and that Jesus takes us from these moments of faith and these encounters, and then God catapults us out of those moments into His service. And what we realize is that sometimes we make our Christianity and our faith about so little. We, we argue over nuances. We argue over Bible verses. We argue over things. And, and we sometimes tend to say that even our faith is better than someone else's. And but what we realized here at Bolingbroke as we were preparing this series is that, that God was calling us to so much more. And as I was preparing for this sermon, I, I realized that if I could rechange the title of this series, 
that it would not be so much more, but that it would be so much better. You know, we live in a world where we want more of so many things, right? We want more time. We want more money. We want more retirement. We want more and better jobs. We want more relationships. We, we all seem to want more of something in our lives because we've bought into the belief that if we have more of this one thing, whatever it is for you, that then your life is going to be better. But as I was reading scripture and I was kind of pouring over these passages this week, I realized it's not that God is calling us to so much more of something, but that God is calling us to so much better. God wants us to build a better church. God wants us to be better disciples. God wants us to have better relationships. God wants us to have better service. God wants us to be better Adventists. God desires better Not because God is in heaven looking down and waiting to judge us, waiting to strike us down with lightning, but that God is asking us to to so much better because He knows that when we come up to what God is asking us, when we can meet the expectations of what Jesus wants for us, that we will experience a better life. Not necessarily an easier life. Not a life free of pain and suffering, Our kids will still get sick. We'll still lose people we love. We'll we'll still have problems at work. And sometimes we'll go through relationship problems. But it means that when we come up to the level that Jesus is asking us to, this, this level where we are now living as though Jesus is Lord of our lives and our decisions and our values and the mission for our lives is shaped by the message of Jesus, then even when we go through hardships, we'll know that we're living for so much better and we're living for so much more. So as we come to the end of our series, I I realize that that what God desires for us is a more robust and authentic and audacious kind of faith, the kind of faith that the Bible says that if you just have the, the size of the seed of a mustard seed, that you can move mountains and you can still the storms. God wants us to level up our faith because God has a plan for each one of our lives. And so as we come to the end of this series, I I really want to look at some of the words of Jesus that that when we stop to really ask, they're kind of problematic. They're, They're really difficult questions if we're honest. Now, I know some of us, what we do when we come to a passage that might be hard, we we have this way of explaining it away. We just say, well, well, this is what this means, and and then we just move on. But today I want to look at these passages, and and it'll do what it often does for us. It'll take us to other places in Scripture to get a deeper understanding. But but what I want to do is really look at these words of Jesus, and to give you context before I read them. Jesus had just finished having his last supper with his disciples in the upper room. It was Thursday night. Hours from then, Jesus would be arrested. The next day, he would be crucified, and he would be dead. So this is the last, the last hours of Jesus' freedom. And he takes this time to share extremely important messages for his people, like a mixtape of his greatest hits. You know, when my wife Kara and I first started talking, and you know, I was smitten from the beginning. She was everything I wanted in a woman I never thought that I would find. And so when when God finally allowed us to meet and this relationship began to progress, I like I did what you know I think would was a right thing to do I created my now wife a mixtape now it wasn't an actual tape or a cassette or even a CD but it was a playlist on Spotify that I shared with her and and it was one of those things that we do where we want to tell that person just how much we really like them so I put all these really great songs on there these great love songs but because I wasn't sure exactly how she felt about me I knew she liked me but I didn't know if she was as in like with me as I was with her and so I would I try to throw her off by putting in like a breakup song by Simon and Garfunkel or a song by Coldplay that had absolutely nothing to do with relationships. And so I try to throw her off. And, and if you talk to her now, she she will tell you how confused that was. So I was successful. <laughs> but more importantly than that, I, I, I shared all of these beautiful love songs, really telling her how I felt. Uh, without me actually saying those words because I was afraid of rejection. I was afraid that, hey, maybe she doesn't feel the same way and, and then I'm going to be sad. So I gave her this mixtape 
And it worked because it, it conveyed to her how I felt. And what was even better is then she added some of her own songs that I think were telling me how she felt. And so we were able to tell each other how much we meant to each other without actually having to say the words before it was, you know, before it was too soon. And so we, we create these playlists of our lives to kind of convey these messages. And so when we look at the passage that we're going to look at tonight, or, or actually today, we see that Jesus almost puts a sense of a mixtape of, of some of his most important teachings. And within that, like, like Jesus tells his disciples, hey, if, if you really want to be my follower, then you're going to love your neighbor. You're going to love one another and you're going to love me. Jesus says, you know, don't let your hearts be troubled. If you go through a difficult time in your life, especially at funerals when we lose someone, we, we read that passage in John 14 that says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in me, believe also in my Father. And he says, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And so Jesus is really laying down these heavy tracks, Bible verses that we come to time and time again. And Jesus says, listen, I, I'm giving you my very best stuff. But within that, there is a passage in John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 10. And here are the words of Jesus. He says, The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his work through me. Verse 12. Very truly I tell you that the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And, in fact will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus says that the one who believes in me will do the works that I do. In fact, will do even greater works than me. And this is one of those passages in scripture that, you know, we look at this and we think, Jesus, are you, are you saying the right words. Like, Jesus, did you have like a mental lapse all of a sudden? Jesus is literally saying that if you believe in Jesus, that you will do greater works than he did. I don't know about you, but that just doesn't compute with my mind. Now, I knew I was preaching from this passage four weeks ago. And I do that thing that preachers do where we know a passage and we know where we're going. And we think about it, you know, every minute of every day to try to figure out where we're going. And, and for some reason... Like, I wasn't hearing a word from God about where he wanted me to go with this passage. And so I did that thing where, you know, you have your Word document open and your, that, that cursor is just blinking on that blank canvas. And I just, I didn't know how to write. And, and I started typing all sorts of things, but nothing was really where God was leading me. And, and so God does that thing where when you think you know what you're going to say, God's like, he, he, he somehow pumps the brakes on your mental process and says, all right, like, before you get to where you think you're going, let me take you on a journey. And so what I realized is that God forced me to stop what I was going to say so that he could take me through an object lesson, so that he could show me as the preacher that, listen, you're not just going to jump to the end. There's a journey. There is a process that you need to go through before you can explain this passage more. I mean, it was literally, I had nothing on my brain. And so God led me through passages in the New Testament. God led me through passages in the Old Testament. He, he took me to the story of Elijah, where Elijah is fed by the ravens, where Elijah is fed by a widow that has no food, who's literally wanting to die because she has nothing to live for. He took me to the story of how Elijah then heals this widow's son, and now she believes in him. And, and what I realized that God was doing was, like, don't just assume that a passage means the thing you want it to mean. We do that so much of the time when we come through a passage in Scripture that sometimes is difficult. We, we make it say what we already accept to be true. And God sometimes is like, that, ugh, that's not even what the Scripture means. So when we come to this passage in John 14, verse 12, Jesus says that the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And in fact, will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. You know, these words of Jesus are perhaps one of the most telling words about what it means to be a disciple and a follower of Christ. He says that the one who believes will do the works that I do. The one who believes. You see, we were programmed as humans from the time that we were born to begin to cultivate this sense of belief and of faith. Here's what I mean by this. If you're into any kind of sports, and, and even if you're not into sports, but maybe you tune in every four years when the Olympics are on, and I know the Olympics are this year, I believe, 
But even if your team or your player is down by who knows how many points, what faith does within us is that we still believe that our team can come back. It may be unlikely, it may be improbable, it, it may be almost impossible, but until that last buzzer buzzes, we believe that our person, our team can come back. And so we're naturally hardwired for faith. And Jesus says, listen, if you would just believe in me, if you would just accept who I say I am, if you would just accept the work that I have come to do, if you would just believe in me, you will do not only the works that I do, but even greater works. You know, what's interesting is like these people weren't ready to hear what Jesus was saying to them. The disciples had been following him day in and day out for three and a half years. I mean, they had 24-7 access to Jesus. And even this message was a hard message for them to understand because, see, they were living for something else. The followers of Jesus thought that what Jesus was about to bring them was literally an insurrection, that Jesus was going to come and stage a revolt and that he would overthrow the Roman Empire that had occupied Jerusalem, and that then they would have positions of power, that they would then have these positions of authority, and they would now be the rulers. I mean, you can read the New Testament, and you can see that that's what so many of the disciples thought that that they wanted and what Jesus was giving them. And what we find is that they were focusing on the wrong thing. And so Jesus, he comes and he says, Listen, I want so much better for you. You think that what you want is earthly possessions and power and material gains. You think that what you want is just having a better life here. But what Jesus is saying is like, no, I want to give you a life that lives for so much better, a life that lives for so much more. And so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to keep your finger on this page and we're going to go to another passage so that we can get a clearer understanding of what Jesus came to do. And I know you know, we think, well, well, Jesus came to save us and forgive us of our sins. Like, yeah, that, that's like the, the heaviness of Jesus' vision. Like, that is, the, that is like the, the end game final mission that Jesus comes to accomplish. But Jesus also does a whole lot of other things in the three and a half years of his life. You know, if Jesus had just come to take care of the sin problem, he wouldn't have spent three and a half years with 12 disciples literally downloading to them everything he wanted them to know so that they could then take his work beyond the borders of what Jesus was able to do. So I wanna look at a passage where Jesus literally says in plain, well, in plain Greek, but in English now as we read it, why he came. And so in Luke chapter four, verse 14, verse 14, Jesus says, Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. And Jesus began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. You know, I can just imagine Jesus coming to the synagogue. And the Bible tells us that that Jesus had this fame, that, that people were coming to hear Jesus speak. He was one of our superstar pastors of the first century where people wanted to hear his message. People liked the message of Jesus. People liked how he talked about forgiveness and about love and about charity and about compassion and about healing people. Like People liked that part of Jesus's ministry. But when it came to then calling people to then be a part of that ministry, people were kind of reticent to join that because people just were interested in what they could get out of Jesus and they weren't always interested into how they could actually be of service to Jesus. And so the Bible tells us that the word about him had spread and there was fame. And people, I mean, the Bible tells us that thousands of people would come to hear Jesus speak. I mean, thousands of people is a big deal. 
And so he comes to the synagogue, and oftentimes in the first century, that's how they would read the Bible. They, they didn't have Bibles on their cell phones. They, they didn't have parchment papers at home with the Bible. There, there was typically only one Bible per region or per town. There was very limited. So if you wanted to hear the word, uh, you only could hear it if you were a man because you were the only ones that were allowed into the synagogue. And then they would read this and then they would discuss and argue and really talk about this. And so Jesus gets up, they hand him a scroll and he reads from a prophecy in the Old Testament that says that the Lord will come, that the Son of Man will come to bring good news to the poor, to release the captives, to give the blind sight, to let the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus says, today in your hearing, this has been fulfilled. Jesus literally does the first century equivalent of doing a mic drop because he says that what you have been waiting for, I am now here. You see, when, when it was just Jesus being a great preacher, talking about what people already believed and, and maybe just taking it a little bit deeper, everybody, I could just imagine in the first century, people saying amen, hooting and hollering in the crowd, people being grateful for what Jesus was saying. But the moment that then Jesus takes that next step, the moment that then Jesus calls them to believe something a little bit harder, the moment that Jesus calls them and stretches their faith a little bit, everyone's like, well, I'm out. Because a few verses later, it would tell us that the very same people who had heard of Jesus' faith, who, who were amazed and liked his teaching, those same people were ready to stone and kill Jesus. Because sometimes when, when God stretches us, and it takes us beyond the comfort of our comfort zones. It, it challenges even what we have thought has been true for so long. That the moment that we are stretched, like Jesus is stretching his people, it's hard for us to continue to move forward. But Jesus is always in the, in the business of stretching you, of growing your understanding about not only who Jesus is, but what God desires for your life. Jesus says that those who believe that in those moments when God is stretching your belief, God is stretching your faith, God is stretching your character, that in those moments, that if you can hold on to the belief, even if it doesn't fully compute in your mind, even if it doesn't fully make sense in your mind, but the moments when Jesus is stretching your faith, that if you can hold on to that belief, that you will not only do the works of Jesus, but you will do even greater works. But here's the kicker. The, the verse that I just kind of went right past that was of great importance. In Luke 14, it says that Jesus was filled with the power of the Spirit. Jesus was filled with the power of the Spirit. And then he was given the authority. He was given the courage he needed to stand up in front of people that he knew were going to try to kill him a few minutes later. But he says, this is what God has called us to. You see, everyone liked Jesus when he was preaching good news. Everybody liked Jesus when he was performing signs and wonders. Everybody liked Jesus when he wasn't really calling us to define our relationship with him. Everybody liked Jesus until he stretched what they had accepted as true. And so Jesus is stretching us today. When he says that those of you who believe, you see, God just... God just needs you to believe a little bit. The Bible says if, if you could have faith the size of a mustard seed, which is the smallest of the seeds, a tiny little seed, if you can just have an inkling, if you can just open the door of your heart to believe that God can do miraculous things, that if you can just open your heart the slightest bit to let a little bit of the Spirit of God in, that God can do infinitely more through you than the ministry of Jesus in the first century. Now, it's not that you are going to forgive people's sins. It's not that you, I mean, you may heal people through the power and through the name of Jesus. The Bible is clear that healing is still available. But what it means is that God just needs a foothold in your life to believe so that God can do so much better and so much more through your life. You know, here at the Bolingbroke Church, we have heard this message loud and clear 
which is why we have been willing to reimagine and rethink church, which is why we've been outdoors and, and not just meeting every single week, but being open to where the Spirit is asking us to create connection events, to create Serve Saturdays, because we want to live into this narrative of Jesus that says that He came not only to proclaim the good news to the poor, to release the captives, to give the, sight, to give the blind sight, that Jesus' life actually made tangible, real practical differences in the lives of people. And we believe that when Jesus says that we will do greater works, it doesn't mean that you will forgive people's sins. But what it means is like, listen, Jesus's ministry never went beyond maybe a 60 mile radius. Like Jesus didn't have internet. Jesus didn't have email. Jesus didn't have, I mean, Jesus had his two feet and his voice and the strength of his voice. And that was as far as his ministry went. But when he comes to the disciples, he says that they will do greater work. Their work will be the ever expanding work of Jesus. And we know that this is true because now in 2021, in the village of Bolingbrook, outside of the city of Chicago in Chicagoland, we are now continuing the work that Jesus began in the first century that spread through the disciples and that now continues to be what God is asking us to do. He is wanting us to be the kind of people, the kind of Jesus people that when we encounter people, their lives are blessed and better because of it. You see, people like Jesus in the first century because their lives were made better because of it. And we want to be the kind of community that makes and enriches and blesses people's lives for the better because we've been encountered by Jesus. And now we want others to have that same encounter. So when Jesus says that they will do greater works, that you will do greater works, what Jesus was actually doing is that he was speaking life and he was speaking a new imagination into the life of the disciples. In essence, Jesus was setting the bar, the bar higher so that they could live up to the expectation and they would own what Jesus was doing. You see, Jesus was basically telling them, forget about earthly power. Forget about the earthly things. Forget about the worldly things. Don't worry about insurrection and revolution. Listen, don't even worry about Rome. Like who can, like that is too small minded to worry about having earthly power and being in, in power and government. Who cares about that? Because what Jesus was doing was so much more, so much better. And Jesus was raising the expectation and speaking life into them so that they could carry on the work. And Jesus says, that this would happen because he would be going back to the Father and he would be sending the Spirit. You know, sometimes we need someone, in this case, the passage in Scripture and Jesus' voice in our lives, to raise the expectation of the things that we have given our lives to. The greater works. We believe that, that service begins in here at the church, we, we believe that when you come to church, it's not just to listen to a sermon and to experience great worship music and to say hi to your friends in the hallway. We believe that, that we begin to serve within the church and in all of the ministries that we have here, that then that gives us an imagination to expand beyond the walls of the church. You know, one of the things that, that we realized over the last 15 months that that even while we weren't gathering in person, that the reach and the influence and the ministry of our church was expanding across the internet, right? We were, we were reaching more people than we thought that we would be reaching. Not only that, but there was people locally who, because we were online and providing this worship service, that they started attending our church because they saw this. And, and, and that's part of the greater works that Jesus is calling us into. He just needed to speak that into your life. And sometimes when we're fortunate, there are people in our lives who will speak this newness into us that then expands our understanding and broadens our imagination about what it means to be faithful to God. So this reminds me of a story that I think I've shared here before. Uh, so I'll make it kind of quick. But when I was in the seventh grade, I remember being in math class and it was probably just a basic seventh grade math class algebra. I don't even remember what it was. And I still remember my teacher, Miss Cass, who back then I thought was an English accent, but now I'm realizing as my world has expanded that it was probably just a, an accent from the South. <laughs> but I still remember sitting on, in my little cubby. I, I went to a school that didn't have a lot of resources. Um, it was you know, in the hood. And so people that were going there weren't necessarily there to, 
continue to expand their education, but they were there because that's just where you went during the day. And so I remember sitting with some of my friends who probably weren't the best students and they would talk a lot and I wanted to be cool. So I wouldn't really talk, um, but I would also just kind of participate in what they were doing. Sometimes they would copy off me, which I think now looking back was funny because I was like, yeah, go ahead and copy off me. It's not the right answer, right? I was terrible at math. But I still remember there was one day where I think they were particularly acting up and and Miss Cass calls me outside and I was always so worried about being in trouble. I never liked being in trouble. I didn't like being called out. So she called me outside and I thought to myself like, look, I, maybe she found out that they were cheating off my paper. Maybe, maybe she's just upset that we're talking too much. And I could already hear my mom and my dad being upset with me because they were very strict parents. But anyway, I, I come outside, she stands there. She just looks at me for that for those silent moments where people just look at you because they're about to say something and you don't know what it is. She says to me, you know, I don't know what you think about yourself, but I know that you're not like some of these other students. She says, don't let yourself be brought down by some of the stuff they were doing. But she says, I see within you someone who is a leader and you will lead people in the future. And she says, just make sure that you don't allow yourself to be derailed from the life that you were created for. And then she walked inside and I, stand, I stood out there thinking to myself, hey, this woman doesn't know me. I come, to, I come to her class once a day for one semester. I said, how can she be speaking this into me? But now I can tell you that 35 years later or 28 years later, I can still remember those words as clear as if she had just told me five minutes ago. But you see, I didn't see myself as anything more than just this Mexican kid that was just gonna be a part of, of, of what everyone else was doing and just going through the system. But, but what she did to me was speak life she raised the bar of the expectation of my life and then she believed in me and every day after that she would not allow me to succumb to what might be easier she did not allow, allow me to revert to my comfort zone but rather she was calling me into something more that i believe now years later that god used a math teacher at a public high school in the hood to speak a word of truth and life into me that God would then use if only I would believe. If only you would open your life and your heart and your soul to believe a little bit is all God wants in your life because God's not gonna force you to do anything. I mean, we see from the beginning of scriptures to the very end of scriptures that God doesn't force us to do anything. All God does is invite you into a relationship. God invites you to enter into his presence. God invites you into this relationship because what God wants to do is to fill you with the power of the Spirit. See, that's why Jesus was able to do what he did. I mean, Jesus was God, but the Bible tells us time and time again that Jesus was filled with the Spirit. And Jesus tells us that we would do greater works if we believed and because God would fill you with the Spirit of God, with the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Bible literally says that, that God lives within you. The Spirit of God lives within you. The breath in your lungs is the breath of God who gives you life, who sustains you. But so much of the time, we look at all of the limitations in our lives. We look at all of the reasons why we're not good enough. We look at all of the reasons why we can't do something more great for God. We look at all of the other responsibilities in our lives and all Jesus is asking is that you would simply have a little belief. Because with a little belief, God can do tremendously more than you could ever imagine. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus was filled with the Spirit, and Jesus wants to fill you with the very same Spirit. John 16, 13 says that when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. That when the Spirit, the Advocate, when the Spirit of God comes into your life, He will lead you. Right now, you may be asking yourself, all right, I'm ready to do the greater works, but I don't know what that work is. And, and the truth is, is you don't have to know. 
Just like when I was trying to write this sermon and I wasn't sure where God was asking me to go, God didn't need me to know where I was going to go. God didn't need me to see the end before I started. God wanted me to have the right things and the right priority in the right place. And what God was asking me to do was simply to enter into His presence, to open the heart of my life, to believe in Him, and God will take care of the rest. Because the way that God works in our lives is that it is the Spirit of God that leads and guides you as you move forward. And so I know the question becomes, well, how do I be filled with the Spirit? How do I know what the Spirit is saying? And that's what's so beautiful about the life of faith, about the so much better of the life of faith that Jesus is calling us into. You know, when you live by the Spirit, I'll be honest with you, in some ways, it's harder because the Bible says that you can either live by the Spirit or live by a bunch of sets of rules and regulations. Now, we love rules and regulations as people because now we know like, okay, this is a thou shalt do and this is the thou shalt not do. And, and so we like these rules because we can point to it and be like, oh, I did that today well. Or I didn't do that so well today. But when you live life by the Spirit, it's, it's no longer a list. It's a constant daily intentional entering into the presence of the Spirit, making room in the Spirit of God for your life. And the more that you make room for the Spirit means that you're going to have to start saying no to some of the other things in your life. Because when you say yes to some stuff, you have to say no to other stuff. And when you're going to say yes to the better, to the, to the Spirit of God, there's going to be some things in your life that you're going to have to reorganize. There will be things in your life that you're going to have to say no to. There will be things in your life that you will have to cut out of your life if you are going to be able to be present to the Spirit. The Bible tells us, do not quench the Spirit of God. Do not quench, which means that there are things that we can do in our lives that will silence and quench the Spirit of God in our lives. So when Jesus is calling us to believe, he is asking us to make room for the Spirit in our lives. When Jesus is asking us to do greater works, he is asking that our lives be lived in such a way that tangible, good, and practical things are done for others. But it begins with being filled with the Spirit as Jesus was filled with the Spirit. So I don't want to leave you hanging. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15, I'm going to finish with this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. So the Bible prescribes that the way that we quench the Spirit in our lives is when we selfishly live only for what we want. When we live the way the disciples live, where they just wanted earthly and worldly possessions and earthly power, when they were just worried about enjoying their life and, and having more, the way that we quench the Spirit is by focusing on the wrong things and chasing after the wrong things. But the way that we can be filled with the Spirit, it's actually by doing things. Not because we're earning the Spirit of God, but by practicing certain kinds of practices and rhythms in our lives, we're opening our hearts for Jesus. And the Bible is clear. He says, rejoice always. Give gratitude always. Always, when you're busy giving gratitude, you're going to not have enough time to be comparing your life. When you're busy rejoicing over what God has done in your life, you're not going to be busy fighting with other people. When you're busy rejoicing and having gratitude, you're not going to be looking at how there's things that God hasn't given you that you still want. Part of enriching your life and having this spiritual life and, and, and feeding your soul with the Spirit of God is creating these windows of gratitude in your life where you're constantly, intentionally seeing the blessings of God in your life. It says, rejoice always. Then he says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Have a mindset, have a life of prayer. Don't just pray in the morning and at nighttime, but pray throughout the entire day. And what that does to you isn't just praying for that thing that you've been asking for, but the more that you're in conversation with someone, the more that relationship grows. The more you're in conversation with someone, the more you're listening to someone, the more in enriching this relationship can be. And that's what Jesus is asking when he says to pray always. He says, be open to the Spirit of God always in all moments at all times. 
not just when you open up your Bible, not just when you're at church, but be open to the Spirit of God in every moment of the day. And then he says, give thanks in all circumstance. You see, the way that we are filled with the Spirit is, is really making a shift in the way that we see the world, making a shift in our perceptions, changing our mental models, and realizing that when we practice these things, what we're actually doing is creating space in our lives for the Spirit of God to allow our faith to flourish as He leads us to the greater works. And so we come to the end of this series knowing that God is calling us to so much more, calling us to so much better, calling us to live life in the Spirit so that we can be faithful to do the very works of Jesus and even greater, more expanding works of Jesus. But you know, as we come to the end of this series, this isn't the end. I think what we've seen over the last year and a half or so that every end of a series, like what we've realized as a staff is that we want to prolong it because God continues to reveal to us. So what we're doing beginning next Saturday, we're starting our summer series, right? A little bit into the summer, but we're starting our summer series and it's called Anchored. And what we believe is that sometimes in our lives, we have anchored our lives to the wrong things. And one of the things that we've noticed throughout this pandemic is for many people, not, 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 not necessarily only in our church, but for many people, Christianity across the board, that for many of them, and you might be one of them, that people anchored their faith to what happens in church on a Saturday morning. And our faith was anchored in church. And so the longer that we weren't gathering in person, our faith became weakened and we begin to feel like our faith was deficient. And we saw the church as the thing that we needed in order to attend so that God can fill us. But the reality is that God was wanting to enter into your presence, that God was wanting you to enter into his presence on a daily basis so that he could fill you. And what we want to do for you, in essence, is pandemic-proof your faith. Should we ever come to another moment when we can't open church? And, and as, a, as, a, as a movement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we know that there will be a day when there, we may not have access to a church. And, and there may be a day when we don't have access to a church, we may not ever come back to the church. And so what we want to do is to give you the tools, the practices, the rhythms that you need so that you can continue to believe and your faith would continue to grow and so we don't want you to anchor your faith to a church. We don't want you to anchor your faith to a worship service. We don't want you to anchor your faith to the wrong thing, but we want to teach you what it looks like to anchor your faith in Christ. Because if we can do that well, then we will have fulfilled the mission of creating spaces for the people God misses the most. We want you to anchor your faith in Christ. And over the next eight weeks, we're going to have guest preachers. I'll be speaking, Pastor Dave will be speaking, and we are going to go deep into what it looks like to anchor our faith in Christ so that we cannot be shaking when troubling times come, so that we can know that our faith will grow even in the moments of uncertainty and darkness. So we want to continue to invite you back to learn how to live life in the Spirit and create more space in your life for the Spirit to fill you, for your belief to grow, and so that you can be faithful to do the greater works. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your love and for your mercy. We're grateful that you are calling us to partner with you, to cooperate with you in what you're doing in this world. And so my prayer now for my friends, for my family, for my church, for myself, for the leaders. Teach us to believe the kind of faith that it needs so that we could be faithful when you call us to greater works. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. How's it going, Bolingbrook Church family? Thank you all so much for joining us today. We're so happy that you're here, you're, and we're so happy that you got to spend this time in worship with us. And thank you so much 
for joining us this whole month of June in our sermon series, So Much More. We really hope that it prepares your heart and your mind for what God is gonna be bringing to you and us this season. We're starting a brand new sermon series that's lasting from July into August, and it's our Bolingbrook Church Summer Series. And our Summer Series is always so much fun because we have guest speakers as well as local speakers uh, coming to talk about our new series called Anchored. And Anchored is our sermon series all about the practical disciplines that you could use to deepen your relationship with God. From prayer, to fasting, uh, to preaching, all these different ways that you are able to help proclaim Jesus in your life and deepen and anchor yourself in His love and in His relationship with you. And so we wanna hope that you join us on this sermon series from July into August called Anchored. So invite your friends and your family uh, because we want to be able to spread the good news of an anchored relationship with Christ to as many people as possible. We also want to connect everyone during the week and connection matters a lot here at this church. And we want to let you know that we are having a movie night on our lawn. That's right. We've rented a massive projector uh, that we want to invite all of you and your friends and your family around the area to come on our lawn July 10th. That's at 8 p.m. The doors, the gates will open and the movie starts at 8.30. We want to invite all your friends and your family and even our neighbors here in this local area to invite us on our on our little lawn in the backyard to be able to watch this movie and connect with each other uh, and just have a great time and enjoy the summer season. We also want to invite you to our Push Prayer Line page on Facebook. And this is called our Bolingbrook Church Push Line. You can search that in the search bar and that'll lead you to our uh, Prayer Line page where you can connect during the week, share your requests and pray with one another. And our line is always open, like we always say, at 7.30 a.m. on Monday mornings where we can start our weeks off together in prayer. We also want to share that on our Bolingbrook Church website, bolingbrook.church, you can share a request there as well that we can pray over. We also want to connect you to our newsletter on our website. If you go to bolingbrook.church, scroll down, you'll see a way to sign up for our newsletter. And this is a way that you can stay up to date with all the different events that is happening here at Bolingbrook Church. We also want to thank you all so much, as usual, for partnering with us here at this church because we have a vision here, and that is creating spaces for the people that God missed the most. And every single time you give of your time and of your resources, it goes to supporting that vision. And so we want to thank you so much for all the time and effort that you have put into this church because we've seen uh, ways that God has been working constantly through the Bolingbrook Church. And so if you want to give of your time, we want to send you over to our link in the description below where you are able to sign up for our food pantry, which is a reoccurring ministry that happens here at Bolingbrook Church to feed the greater area of Bolingbrook, Romeoville, and Plainfield, as well as the surrounding areas as well. We also want to thank you so much for shining up for Feed My Starving Children. That's happening today. That's right, this afternoon. All the slots were filled thanks to all of you. And we're able to package this food and send it across the world to starving children around the world where they are able to be fed and able to be nourished and able to live another day thanks to you. We want to always thank you so much for giving of your resources. You can uh, give online at bolingbrook.church forward slash giving, or you can sell quick pay to info at bolingbrook.church, or you can text to give, or you can give online as well. We want to thank you so much for partnering with us here at Bolingbrook Church. Thank you so much for being here. We'll see you all at our in-person service next week, July 3rd at 1230 p.m. Thank you all so much. We'll see you. Take care and God bless.